Here's another one you don't want to hear. Frankly, neither do I. Hello and welcome to another Power Court Hour podcast, episode 5. I'm your host, Anthony Merchant. Thank you so much for checking out this week's episode. I cannot believe we're already five episodes in. I feel like it was just yesterday I was doing a little intro for this show. But uh, thank you so much for checking out the podcast. I've really, really been enjoying doing it. And I mean, if you did not uh, check out the last episode, episode 4 with our guest Steve Kravak, I mean, just an amazing, amazing guy to talk to. He was such a treat to talk to. And uh, I think it's definitely worth your time to go back and listen. If you did not listen, I mean, he is an acclaimed uh, producer, engineer. I mean, he's produced and engineered MXPX, Blink-182, Less Than Jake, No Effects, 7 Seconds, Tsunami Bomb, Slick Shoes, Homegrown, uh, Wayne Kramer of the MC5, way, way more. I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg. But, I mean, the guy the guy has produced some successful albums and, I mean, really, really cool and has been doing that for decades, and then just finally released his first solo album, Stephen Bradley, and uh, we talked all about that, all about working with Blink-182 and MXPX and a whole lot more, talked about his record label, and I mean, just everything in between. If you heard it, you already know all this, but if you have not, go check it out. It is a really, really good, uh, I mean, he's just a good guest, you know what I mean? It has has nothing to do with uh, so much of the topic as much as he's just a really interesting guy, and I mean, no matter what I feel like you throw at him, he is a, a really good, a really good person to interview. He's just so full of so much stuff. You know what I mean? Like as a musician, you know, on both sides, as someone who does it as a musician, but also someone who, you know, while still being a musician, works more as a producer and engineer on things. You know, I feel like he gets both sides, and it was neat to kind of talk to him about both aspects of it because I do think there's something different, and uh, we spoke about it. But kind of like the whole thing of how anyone can kind of self-produce their own record now. You can engineer it yourself. I mean, there's even an apps now I've seen where, like, it will master it. Like, you can basically master stuff at home or it will, like, there's programs that I think will master it for you. Like, I mean, it's one of those things where it's, like, it's a modern convenience, which is awesome. But it's, like, those are also very powerful things. So to just kind of go, well, you know, you press a button now and you can do it. Certain things automation isn't good for. I would say mastering is probably one of those. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't know all the ins and outs of that, so I won't, like, get too far into that. But I think it's crazy that, you know, there's, there's like, software and stuff where without, without knowing how to master anything, you can kind of do it yourself. And I don't know. So things like that, I think, become pitfalls. And it's probably something I could do a whole episode on. But I think a lot of bands, I mean, self-producing is not always a bad thing. And I think that's also a very broad spectrum. I mean, because just recording yourself is basically self-producing. You know, being a producer can mean so many things. It can mean you go in and you go, yeah, I don't like this part. I don't like this part. You should cut this out. And I mean, maybe you add nothing else. You know what I mean? Maybe you don't play on the record. Maybe you don't add parts. You just kind of tell them, well, I don't like this and I like this. There's other people where producers play on the record. Maybe they play solos. They might play lead. They might play, I mean, just, you know, multi-instruments that the other members don't play. I mean, a producer can do so much, even just sequencing of the record, you know, going, I think this would sound best here. We should move this song. You know, maybe this song should be the closer. So, I mean, being a producer is so... It's just such a vast thing, you know what I mean? Like it can mean it can mean so many different things, but I think that's part of the problem is that there's a lot of lacking when when you know bands self-produce now. Not every band, and I think there's a lot of people who figure the stuff out before they do it, and I think it ends up paying off. But there's a lot of bands who I think put out records, and I won't sit here and like name names of, of albums that I think are like sound terrible because the bands produced them themselves. But there are a lot of records out there that come to mind where I go, those songs are amazing. But the album just does not sound very good. I mean, there's so many that I think of, including of the last decade, because I think that's when it really started, was like the last 10 years of really, I think things kind of came into their own, you know what I mean? Like, we've had GarageBand and Pro Tools and all that for quite a while, but I mean, Pro Tools, specifically, I'd say Pro Tools, in the beginning, I mean, it still has its issues, but, you know, at the very beginning, and I talked about this with Michael Beinhorn, who's a very famous producer and engineer, uh, a few years ago, back in 2018, we talked about it, and actually, he produced one of Korn's records, I don't remember which one, but it was early, it's, it was in the early 2000s, and it was like one of the first records 
apparently to get like produced using I think it was all Pro Tools. I don't I don't want to I don't want to say that I know the entire story off the top of my head. I don't remember all of it. But basically, the corn record that he recorded was one of the first to be recorded with like all Pro Tools, all digital, like really going away from analog, kind of the beginning of that. Like, okay, we can do this all digitally now. And I mean, he talked about all the issues that it had, you know, not being very user friendly, things just crashing left and right, you know. And I think also we talked about this with Steve last week as well, but I mean, including back in the day with Pro Tools of like no one really knowing it well, so you're still navigating it and it's kind of helping one another out. And I think it's become, like I was saying, you know, in the last decade, maybe it's become a little more user friendly, at least to the point where you can do it on your laptop, or your home computer now. But that's such a powerful thing, something like Pro Tools that just jumping into it and going, well, you know, I can figure out how to hit record and like, here's some presets in here. It, it's like, I just don't think that's enough. You know what I mean? You have the tools in front of you, but it's a difference of, of having those in front of you and actually knowing how to apply them and use them. And, you know, I, I think not the producers, it's not like it's it's like, you know, producers are going away. Like, I mean, there's definitely still producers out there and still people who are getting their names out there. Not one of those things where, well, the only producers that are left are the ones who have been doing it for multi-decades and already have, you know, like kind of made their money and whatnot. It's not really like that. I think people can still come up and there's a lot of up and coming producers and stuff. But I do think that, you know, that whole just because you can do it yourself doesn't mean you should. And I think when when it comes to production, a lot of bands have that pitfall where, you know, I mean, sure, if the songs are still good, you'll still listen to the album. But does it sound good? You know what I mean? Not even that it's so polished and squeaky clean, but does it actually sound good? Because a lot of times it ends up sounding like a muddy mess to me, like like the bands don't understand EQ and miking things and even layering things as well. Like, I don't know if it's a mixing issue but a lot of times, and low end, I notice that a lot too. I don't, I don't even know where that would fall because I think it goes further than just you know, kind of EQing things. But kind of the low end, a lot of times, make a lot of records that are self-produced muddy. You know, like I mean, and I, and I don't want to stay on this forever, going why you should self-produce. But it's just interesting to talk to uh, producers, including guys who've been at it for so long, who I mean, in a time before you really did self-produce. I mean. I, I guess you could go back. I mean, there's things like, you know, Bruce Springsteen recorded, in my opinion, his best record, Nebraska, on a, a four track in his bedroom where I, I I think, I don't think anyone else played on it. It's all him. And then, you know, I mean, he, he kind of layered things and added some, you know, like background vocals and I think maybe a second guitar from here, here and there. But it's like, you know, you look back to the 80s and it's like, Bruce Spring, even Bruce Springsteen, like that's that's his record. You know what I mean? His quote unquote self produced record, which I'm sure it was still engineered and stuff by, uh, or not engineered, well maybe engineered, but also like mastered by you know professional and stuff. But it's like his quote unquote self produced, maybe better to say self recorded record, is on a four track in his bedroom. You know, whereas now you can have a whole Pro Tools rig, and I mean do a whole band, not just you, your acoustic, and you know like maybe some overdubs it's like you can you can put like a full-fledged record together in your bedroom with like you know hey i want i want some you know i want an orchestra in this part you get like a digital orchestra you know it, it's insane what's out there but like i said i mean it's almost too much power where you just jump in and going well it's here and i just click and drag on this and i you screw around with this it just doesn't work as well you know i mean trial and error is obviously a thing but it becomes you know, the trial and error ends up being your record. You know, you kind of hear it on the record and go, okay, well, this is them kind of learning how to do this or that. And, you know, I just think that's something lost with producers. I wish more bands would kind of go back to that. And it's not always bad. I've interviewed, I've definitely interviewed my fair share of bands on here where we talk about their new records. And it is commonplace now where they do self-produce. They go, yeah, we record this here or there. And there's the other side to it where it can sound good. You know, if, if the guys are knowing what they're doing. I, I talked to a Mark McMillan of uh, the story changes in Hawthorne Heights last year, and uh, here's another great interview. But the story changes uh, self-produced their last record, "The Hell with This Delicate Equation," but like they had done it quite a bit. Um, Hawthorne Heights has self-produced quite a few records, which they're a good example of that. They've gotten a lot better. I mean, their their first couple EPs that they self-produced in in uh, like 2010. Uh, well, the first actually, I think uh, they put out "Hate" in like 2011, and then "Hope" in like 2012. And uh, or not hope, I mean hurt, and then hope came out in like 2015. But if you even listen to those, you can hear that band get better and better with self-producing. Like hurt kind of sounds like a band, kind of their first go around at, at kind of recording themselves and producing themselves. 
And then by by uh, Hope, I think it's so, I mean, they really kind of figured it out and did a really, really good job. So, I mean, on the News Story Changes record, you know, Mark has, Mark has done this quite a few times now, self-produced things, and it shows, you know what I mean? Like, it pays off. But you have to get there first, you know? I mean, there's examples of that where it's like the News Story Changes record sounds good. It, it isn't, it's not deprived of anything because it's self-produced. You know, it's not like, oh, it's a good record in spite of being, you know, kind of worked all on in-house. Because I think they also did record drums separately. I think, I want to say Mark did say that they recorded that maybe even with Micah of a Hawth or formerly of Hawthorne Heights. I think they may have recorded drums in a Micah studio. I think that was like the only thing they did. Same with Tim Rogner of Alistair. I talked to him last year about Alistair's Best Of where they re-recorded the uh, the songs that were on drive through Records. I don't, I don't think they had the rights anymore, so they kind of went in and re-recorded them. But that was kind of the same deal. That record sounds great, and a lot of it was self-produced. They went in and did like drums and maybe a few other things in studio, and then I think the rest they just – Basically, I mean, Tim, I think, said he recorded his guitar in, like, his bedroom. But you wouldn't know it. You know what I mean? Like, that stuff sounds good. But they're another one. I think they've worked on a few where they've self-produced it. And, you know, I mean, I could go on forever about that. But I, I do think it's something where, like, I think it's awesome you can self-produce now. And that's that's cool. I mean, as a musician, I mean, I, I demo things at home and whatnot. But there's also a difference between, you know, kind of demoing your stuff at home, kind of screwing around with it, and then going – well, I, I know how to do this or that. Because like I said, production is such a wide range. It's like, sure, you may know how to like mic something right, but even even just the outside opinion, I think a lot of times, you know, having being too insular sometimes I don't think is a good thing. And you can also get in your own head or you, you, maybe you're overlooking something. Or same with the thing, you just listen to it so many times ad nauseum that, it, that you know, you kind of get sick of it, even though there's nothing want, wrong with the product. You know, and I think there's a lot of instances like that where you need a producer. And, you know, I mean, a guy like Steve, who we just talked to, amazing, amazing person at that job. So it's like, you know, I, I don't know. Bands self-producing, I also get it from the uh, standpoint of, you know, financially, maybe it's obviously a lot cheaper. And we're in a day and age where records, you know, one there was a time where, you know, records could cost half a million, if not more, to make. I mean, there's definitely records out there. Who knows? Michael Jackson's Thriller, I don't I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I, I think that cost millions to uh, make and I mean there's there's a lot of other ones that historically are crazy expensive that was also in a time where you know record labels would recoup their money and you would make that all back you know you may put millions in that recording but you're also going to make that back tenfold you know people are still buying records and obviously in this day and age you know you a, a little punk band doesn't have you know a hundred thousand dollars lying around and go like oh we can go work with whatever producer we want but you know with that said I, I do think that uh, a lot of times the music can suffer you know, with uh, just producing it all in house. But like I said, it also depends who's doing it. There's obviously musicians who know what they're doing, but I also feel like there's a lot of musicians who don't know what they're doing in that regard, you know, where it's like, I, I do think probably musicians should, you know, I mean, you add your opinion, but it's like stick to their side of you're playing the music, you're writing the songs, then have someone on the other side going, you know, okay. The, if I layer it like this, it sounds better. We can we can add this, and it kind of adds to this part, you know, and kind of play with dynamics and different things like that the producers do. But uh, that is not what tonight's episode is about. But you know, that, that just kind of got me on a tangent since uh, you know last week's uh, guest. I mean, an acclaimed producer, one of my favorites. I mean, I think he's great because Steve Kravak, because uh, you know, he doesn't overproduce bands. He he brings out their best parts, and he kind of gets them. He doesn't get them squeaky clean and polished to where, you know, their grit is gone. He just gets them to where they sound good. You know, he brings the, the strong parts to the forefront and I think makes a band sound really good without taking anything away. You know, you can still be a punk band but still sound good. You know, like a good sounding punk record is is a very possible thing to have. You know, it doesn't have to sound like it was recorded in a garage, you know, and it can still have its grit, which is what Steve does and I absolutely love that. But, you know, it's funny, we're kind of going the other way tonight. Instead of talking about production, we're going kind of the other way. And I want to talk all about live records. You know, I was thinking about what I wanted to uh, talk about on this week's Power Chord Hour podcast. And I don't know what kind of brought it up, but live records are really interesting to me. They're, they're kind of like I like a good live record, but when a band when a band announces one, I'm not always, you know, I mean, unless it's a band that I absolutely love. There's certain bands where it's like ah, anything they release, I'm stoked. But Live records to me are kind of like special editions of albums or like deluxe editions where 
I got to kind of look at the track listing. It's like with a live record, I think there's a lot of different things that go in it to being really good. You know, other times I'm kind of like, well, I'm probably just going to listen to the studio, you know, version of the song anyways. I don't know that I'm going to jump, you know, and go, oh, I want to listen to this song. I'm going to pick the live, you know, the version off this record. I'm normally not that guy. And it's the same with deluxe editions where it's like, well, what am I getting? Am I getting unreleased, like, studio recordings? Or am I getting really rough demos of songs? You know what I mean? Like, there's times where it's like it's a deluxe edition and you just get seven different versions of a song. It's like, here's this one with the hi-hat mic'd with an SM58 mic. Or, you know, here's this one with two guitars instead of three. Or here's this one with, like, this effect on the vocal. Or, you know, here's this one without any effect on the vocal. Like, things like that where it's like, I guess it's kind of interesting to look at the process, but it's probably not something I'm going to listen to a lot. But, you know, it's the same with a live record where it's like, you know, sometimes it's a novelty to me. Maybe I'll check it out like once and it's like, oh, okay, maybe I'll revisit it here and there. But there are some really, really good live records. So, I mean, I want to talk about tonight really what makes a good live record and, you know, what kind of draws your attention to it. And, I mean, starting out, I think the biggest thing for me is the track listing. And, I mean, really like... Like, I want something that really shows off a band's career. Like, like a strong live record, to me, will show you, like, all the strong points of a band's career. You know, I mean, even if it's a greatest hit set with, like, you know, other songs kind of thrown in, maybe some B-sides or kind of just fan favorites. You know, there's certain ones like that. Like, the one that jumps to my head right away, probably one of my favorite live records, including of the last uh, five years, would be Against Me's 23 Live Sex Acts. That is that is such a good live record, and it's their best one. They put one out on Fat Records. Oh, man, I think it would have been uh, after, I believe it was after Searching for a Former Clarity, in between that and New Wave, because New Wave was not out yet, and they were still on Fat Records. But uh, they, they've put out some live stuff in the past, and it's not bad, but this is their best live record. 23 Live Sex Acts. And part of it is that it's a track listing. You know, I I think that uh, the old one that they put out on Fat Records back in like that probably been like 05, maybe 2004, 2005. You know, it was earlier on. So it's it's the stuff off like their first three or four records, whereas this one is kind of a career spanning set and they play something off everything. It's not something where they're only playing new. You know, it's from 2015. So this is uh, this is everything before Shapeshift with me. They're playing stuff off all the records before that. And, I mean, it is a solid set list. Like, there's a couple songs off each record. My only real complaint of the, is that there's not more off New Wave. There is. They do play the opener off New Wave, but if you've heard that record, you may know that they don't get very far. Um, a security guard is being kind of rough with a, with a stage dive. Or I think he may have, maybe not even stage dive. He may have been crowd surfing or something. Whatever the reason was. The uh, security was not being cool in that venue, and uh, Laura stopped playing the song and kind of stopped the set. Like, we're not going to keep playing until you, like, like they were trying to kick the kid out. And, I mean, it's really cool. It's a live, raw moment in the record. Um, but, you know, you don't get that whole song. So it's like you get, I believe, one and a half songs. I think they play that and Thrash Unreal. Like, I would have liked a couple more songs off New Wave, but they play a few songs off each record. And it's such a great example of it. Like, you get to hear something off each album. Like, if you had never heard Against Me before, I don't even know that this is a bad introduction. This may be a really solid one because you get you get songs from every era. And I think also it's cool because a lot of times, kind of going back to production, you know, there's albums where there's more production on it than others, including when it comes to Against Me. I mean, obviously, reinventing Axl Rose, the amount of production on that one compared to the production on, say, New Wave. I mean, where Butch Vig produced that, you know, you have the guy who worked with Nirvana, you know, working on your record. I mean, that one's a lot more polished and clean and layered. There's a lot more guitars on there. There's a lot more effects on the guitars and, uh, you know, and, and as well as White Crosses. And I think that's kind of cool on a 23 Live is that all the songs blend together in a way where you, I mean, as an Against Me fan, you know what records they're off of, but it's like you don't you don't go, oh, yeah, you can tell this is an older song, this is a newer song, because they all just sound like a song, you know, songs coming from a rock band in that moment. You know, it's like it kind of strips away whatever production is on the studio recordings, and it just gives you four people playing these songs. Like High Pressure Low is a good example of that. Like it sounds very different from the studio recording, and I think I think that's one that sounds better 
than the studio recording actually that that may be one where i would take the uh the 23 live version over the uh, white crosses version though i still like the white crosses version but like like strip back like that and then having that bass for the uh, bass intro as well i think they should have did that on the uh, record they probably should have played that intro on the bass as well because it just sounds solid but i i think that album's a good example of that of a band who they i think they purposely probably did that too they knew they were recording the set and they did a career spanning set and it sounds really really good they didn't go well we're promoting this record right now so we're only going to play songs you know mostly songs off the last two albums you know because a lot of times bands will do even against me i mean i saw and and to be fair of course they did this because it was uh it was the record release show for shapeshift with me but i remember that show was good but it was very heavy on like the last three albums which you know i like those records but it's like i wanted to hear more like i don't like i don't think they played anything off uh like the first three records until almost halfway through like the first half of the set, the oldest song was, uh, I don't remember which song they played, but something off New Wave. Like that was like the first half of the set were only new songs really. So, you know, like in something like that, I'm like, well, I like a better mix. And on 23 Live Sex Acts, they just do that. I mean, they, they play stuff off all the albums. It sounds amazing. And the lack of production on it too. Those 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 songs, you can tell. There's two guitars, there's a bass, there's drums, there's lead vocals, and there's some backing vocals. There's not a third guy playing guitar behind the stage. There's no overdubs. They ain't go in the studio after and add things. You know, it's very much raw. There's not a guy playing keyboards under anything to make it sound better. You know, like, nothing like that. There's no, there's no backing band with Against Me. It is just Against Me. And it sounds amazing. Like the guitars, even like I'm, I'm sure there's, I'm sure they use some guitar pedals, but it's like Laura's guitar on it. Basically, just sounds like it's, it's going through, you know, a classic Marshall tube head. You know, just, just she's probably either playing a Ricky or a Telecaster. Um, I mean, Jimmy is, is playing, you know, a Gibson. You can tell, like, you can kind of tell what they're playing. It's not hidden behind, you know, a bunch of like layers of guitars, like. They're playing through, you know, like one cab and one head each. You know, they're not they're not playing a bunch of extra stuff. It's just a rock band playing these songs, and it sounds amazing. Like, like it's the lack of production on it that I also think think makes that live record so good. And I mean, I'd say that's most live records. You know, sometimes you get them, and if you really listen to a live record, not it's not always live. You know, I mean, obviously parts are. But they definitely will go back in in the studio and work with things and fix things. And I don't think they did that on this one. I, I think this is just straight up. You get to hear you get to hear that set like the people who were there heard that set, which I think is just such an important thing. You know, and I, I, I love that live record, the Against Me 23 Live Sex Acts. I, I think that's their best live record. I think it's one of the best, you know, it, it's really them how they are live. I've seen them a few times now, and that's a good representation of uh, how they are live. And it's kind of funny, you know, talking about things, kind of adding things after the fact, going in and, you know, kind of doing post-production on a live album. Kind of sounds absurd, but people do it. And, uh, you know, one of those, this is one of my other favorite live records, but you, you, I've heard things over the years, and I think a lot of others have too, and it's very debatable. But uh, Blink-182's The Mark, Tom, and Travis Show, The Enema Strikes Back, one of my favorite live records, and, you know, including growing up, that was probably one of my first favorite ones. And it, it's great, but that there is talk about that through the years. And I, I think the bands denied it, but, you know, there there's talk about, I believe they went through, fixed some of the guitar. Uh, there, there's a few things that I don't remember off the top of my head that kind of give it away where you can kind of go, oh, that was that was put in in post-production. Like, that was not live. Um, I mean, there's there's like a couple different things. For the most part, it is a live record, but, you know, there there is up for debate whether or not they added things, between, or, you know, afterwards, which I don't really mind. I think it's still a good record. And the other side of that, too, is... It's funny because even even as I say that, that they kind of, it definitely sounds like, if you ask me personally, I think they did. I, I think there's definitely some overdubs. I think even probably some like harmonies from uh, Mark and Tom and stuff. There's a couple things like they went back in and either fixed or they recorded and put in afterwards. You know, if they weren't, if they weren't fixed in the moment, they just added them in studio. And, you know, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think it takes away from the album. It's just funny because, I mean, it's up for years now. That album's like, 
20 years old now and it's like i think to this day it's still kind of like up for debate whether or not things are added or not but the other side of that i mean like with blink 182 it's also still a raw live album like they don't take away all the screw-ups like you can hear when tom fucks up on guitar like there's things like that that you can hear you know i mean they don't they don't go in and overdub things to make you think that like that they're virtuosos. Like anyone who's seen Bl- seen Blink 182 live, like I I love them. They're they're one of my favorite live bands. They've put on some of the best shows I've ever seen. But you don't go them to see the tightest live band in the world. They were never meant to be that. You know, they their strong points are kind of more of the energy of the songs and the music as well as the stage. I mean, the classic stage banter, another thing on this record. I mean, it, it's just classic Blink-182 stage banter. Like, you listen to it. Like, I remember the first time hearing the album. I mean, I'd heard all the songs, obviously. You know all these songs. I was more excited to hear what Mark and Tom were saying in between the songs. Like, just filthy, filthy things. Some of the funniest stuff I think they ever said. I mean, half of the record, there's like 48 just tracks after the live album that are just stage banter. They're just like one-liners that both of them are saying, just ridiculous things. I mean, Tom being Satan throughout the live record, just, you know, with just just a really deep kind of like like effect on his voice and just saying the most heinous things under the name Satan, like just hilarious. Them at their funniest, some of the funniest stage banter I think they ever had. And I, I think that one, like, with with Against Me, you know, with that 23 Live Sex Acts, I think what I like about that album is it's career-spanning, and it's less of a time and place. Like, I mean, obviously, it was recorded in 2015 with the lineup of that time, but it still goes throughout their career. Like I said, it's not one of those ones where you go, oh, you can tell what album that this show was on. You know what I mean? Like, you're like, oh... The, you know, they recorded that album on, you know, the the New Wave tour because, you know, 10 of the 20 songs they played were from New Wave. You know, it's not like that. Whereas with the Mark, Tom, and Travis show, I think it is kind of more of a time and place. But I like that about it. It's in between M of the State and Take Off Your Pants and Jacket. And it's that band in that era. I think it's that band before, I wouldn't say before they got big. That was obviously as they were getting big. But I think it's kind of that that transition over. And it's funny because the stage banter as well. It's this band who went from being a snotty punk band saying the most heinous shit like in between songs, just saying terrible things just to the audience, to then playing arenas to like teenage kids. And it's hilarious when you think about this. Like Next time you listen to the Mark, Tom, and Travis show, remember this. This is this is a punk band like Guttermouth. You know, I mean, Guttermouth is saying the same the same things at this time but in like dive bars do a couple hundred kids. Whereas Blink-182 is doing this in an arena to like 8,000 people. And there's like parents there with like their 13 year old kids. And Tom is up there just, I mean, just say, I mean, just incest jokes, talking about having sex with dogs, just just every everything in between, pretending to be Satan, like the funniest just things, just terrible things that come, including Tom, I, I, I think, I think no matter what, Mark has always had funny stage banter, but Tom is the one who who will just push things, as you can hear on this, because even Mark stops him a few times. But it's so funny because, like I said, it's that time and place, and it's not like they like stopped with that stage banter. Even seeing them, anytime I've seen them live would have been during their reunion, and they still said crazy things. But I think this is really them, like as as really an unfiltered, uncensored punk band still becoming that main, you know, having a mainstream audience. Because you forget that with Enema of the State, you know, that may be a polished record. It may, you know, it may have been a huge record, but it's like they weren't, they weren't huge before that. You know, Dude Ranch got them some exposure, but they weren't, they weren't a household name at that point. And it's, you know, everything after that, you know, obviously they're the the huge Blink-182 that we all know now, but this is kind of that transition of, of that band and then just a snotty punk band. And I think you hear it in, the basically no pun intended but the reckless abandon of what they're saying in between songs and the way they're playing too i mean it's still a fast slop, sloppy punk band you know what i mean sure i think there's overdubs i do think that's one of them there's a few songs where i want to say there's like small solos in the songs yet there's still rhythm guitar being played under there which they're a trio and there's not a second guitar player up there playing with them so thus that either has to be an overdub and i think it is because it doesn't sound like like it's being like it doesn't sound like it's in the moment like you know sometimes bands will do that like you may have a backing track live 
where, uh, you know, maybe there is a second guitar added, but it doesn't sound like that. It sounds like it was added after the fact in post-production. And there's a few things like that, but overall it is a raw record. And it's like, they don't fix the mistakes of like, you know, if Tom plays the wrong note or, you know, one of them sings out of key or something, you know, they, they, they don't fix it in that sense. They just add a few things. But I, I like that too. It is the raw, like I said, it's the energy, you know, they're not, they're not, the most like Travis Barker, one of the greatest drummers out there, including one of the best punk drummers, you know, on there, he's doing some insane things, some crazy fills. But, you know, I always thought it was an interesting thing because you have him really keeping a tight, you know, a tight beat, just doing some crazy stuff while Mark and Tom are a little more loose, though. I think that's probably what works with the three of them, that formula. But, you know, Mark and Tom are kind of playing loose more with energy where Travis, I mean, he's playing with energy as well, but he's, he's still doing it where I think you can go, oh, wow, that guy's like an insanely good drummer, you know, whereas Mark and Tom are less of, hey, I have to play all the right notes. It's more about, you know, what's going to make this sound the best, you know, how, how are we really going to keep this energy up? And I think they do it very well on that record. I, it's a great live record. And, you know, from a band, like I said, who aren't supposed to be perfect, you know, it's not an album that you put on going, I'm about to hear the three great, it's not a rush record, you know, and I'll put it that way. If we're talking about a trio, if you're going to listen to a trio playing live, it's not listening to like Cream or Rush playing a show where you go, wow, those are the world's greatest performers. But I mean that, I mean that with love. They're one of my favorite bands, Blink-182, um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's not news to anyone. They're not the world's greatest players. They're not the world's greatest live band. But they are a great live band because of the energy and the banter and all that. And I think it really shows on this. And also from a great tour that uh, I'm envy of anyone who saw, because I believe that was on the one, their first like headlining tour, like playing arenas. Now, I don't think it was their first headlining tour, but their first one where they were a big, big band like that, you know, pulling in those kinds of people, playing those kinds of venues. And uh, the openers on that were Bad Religion and Phoenix TX. I mean, that that is a show, that is a tour I'd have absolutely loved to see. Um, one of my buddies, actually, Tammy from uh, the band Murder for Girls, shout out to Murder for Girls, a great, great Pittsburgh punk band you should go check out. I believe she saw that tour, which she's a really big Bad Religion fan, so she was there for them. I don't think she, <laughs> I, if I remember correctly, yeah, I don't think she's, she's super into Blink-182 or Phoenix TX. So, I mean, while I'm jealous of her seeing the whole thing, I don't think she was into them as much. I think she said Bad Religion was really good. But I would have loved to see all three of them. That that tour would have been cool. And, you know, <clears throat> kind of with that, that idea with that, why why that one is so good, why, the, why I think that live record resonates with me and why I think it's so solid is because it is a time in a, in a place. You know, sometimes I don't like that in a live record because I go, well, because if it's not their strongest point, I think that was a very strong point for Blink-182, so that's why I like it. I think on the other spectrum of that, and I don't want to sit here and badmouth a bunch of live albums, and it's not even a live album as much as it's a live DVD, but a good example of this in talking about eras would be Alkaline Trio. They actually, in a band that I absolutely love, but they have a DVD out. Uh, Kung Fu Records used to have cool a cool series called The Show Must Go Off, and they did a bunch of live DVDs of bands like Alkaline Trio, The Vandals, Mest, Goldfinger, um, I mean, just so many others. There's there's a bunch out there you can go find. You probably go find them used for like five bucks each. But uh, Alkaline Trio, theirs is live at the Metro in Chicago. It was a Halloween show, and it is part of the Show Must Go Off series. And it's not. I mean, it's not a terrible record. But the thing the thing with it, talking about time and place, I don't think it was Alkaline Trio's most their most solid part of their career. It was it was in between, I believe, from here to Infirmary. And uh, in Good Morning, it was it was like Derek Grant plays on it. It's like the beginning, I believe, of uh, Derek being in the band. I think Mike Falumli just left or or kicked out. I don't remember which one happened. But either way, he was no longer in the band. I believe this was like one of very early on, probably the first year or two of uh, Derek being in the band, who was a great, great drummer. But I just don't think it was their greatest era. I think it was going to that time where Matt kind of had – a lot of it has to do with Skiba's voice, honestly. Matt Skiba's voice, I don't think, is the most solid on it. And I, I think, I also think tone, like his guitar. I think throughout the years he's played different things. And, uh, you know, kind of kind of more modern. In Blink-182, I think he uses a Kemper, which, uh, you know, I mean, I won't go in too far because if you don't know what the hell a Kemper is, and you probably don't care, you know. But uh, basically what it is is a guitar amp that is not a real guitar amp. It's like basically, I don't know, I guess you could call it a computer that has all these different sounds in it. So if you want your guitar to sound like, like say it's for Blink-182 and he wants his guitar to sound like Tom DeLonge's on Dude Ranch, it can sound like that, but then it can also sound like, say, like Alkaline Trio 
on Agony and Irony. You know, he can get that guitar tone as well. Like, it's kind of like that. Like, you can get all these different tones out of there instead of just one. You know, I mean, like, if you're using a, a classic, you know, maybe like a, a Marshall JCM 900 guitar head. I'll use that example because that's what I play through. Like, I love that thing, but I play it because it has a great dirty channel. It's just great distorted guitar. It sounds great to play power chords on. Whereas it may not sound great if I'm trying to record a folk record, you know, or like some kind of like Americana thing, like where I need a really clean tone or I'm trying to like play jazz chords on it or something. It's not made for that. Whereas a Kemper, you can basically play anything you want. It's a modeling amp. It's not a, uh, it's not a tube amp. It, it's all digital instead of analog. But anyway, you know, I, I think, I think uh, Matt's played with a bunch of different things through the years. And I don't, I don't know off the top of my head, everything he's playing on that show, but I don't think his guitar tone is as good as it could be. I think it kind of lacks on the older songs. Like, like it doesn't sound so bad on like the new quote unquote newer given this is, this is a, this live DVD is from like 2003 or something. So, you know, it's like a, it's from like 17 years ago. And I think they're way more solid live now, you know, when, when I, since I've seen them, I mean, the first time I saw them was 2010 and I've seen them quite a few times since I think they're way better than they are on this DVD. And it's the same lineup as well with Matt, Derek and, uh, and, uh, uh, Dan. But I, I think, I think a lot of, I think the guitar tones he has, I think Skiba's voice, I think he's a big part of it why it's just not their best. I think, I don't know what's up with his voice and maybe it's out there. I don't think I've ever learned if it was by choice that he sounded like that. I don't know if his voice was just, you know, kind of destroyed from years of, of singing. I, I don't know what it was, but I think you know what I'm talking about. There's a few albums there where Skiba's voice kind of sounds a little more raspy and different. And, and it's so weird because now he doesn't sound like that. It, it's the oddest thing. So I don't know if he had surgery or he just chose to sing like that. But I, I just think it kind of, like I said, I think it's very much an era of the band. And I don't know that it's their most solid, you know, which is also funny to say because it's not far from from here to Infirmary, which is my favorite record of theirs. But I think it's a transitional piece, you know, at that point, what would have been a new drummer with Derek Grant and, you know, um, it, they were kind of going for a different sound there, you know, they're kind of transitioning into more of a still a punk band, but a little more like rock elements, I would say, and a little more production. And, uh, I just, I just don't think that's the most solid, you know, the most solid one. Now they did the past live records where they did all their albums live and they released those in a box set in either 2016 or 2017, I believe. And that's a much better one. Like to me, that's them it like really into their game, like really, really solid. And I mean, also they rehearsed those albums who knows how many times and were learning songs they haven't played in years, if ever live. And I think it really helped them. I think it's they sound amazing on those. Like, because that's what I'm trying to say is it's not like Alkaline Trio or Bad Live. Like I said, I've seen them live a bunch of times. They sound amazing. But I think on the show must go off that live at the Metro DVD, I don't think it's them at their best. You know, I, I think that's an era where I go, Oh, well, you know, if I'm going to listen to them live, that's not one that I would want to listen to live as much. I would either listen to older stuff, which that was their first proper live release. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's a lot of really good, well-recorded live stuff from them playing it. Like, say, the Fireside Bowl and stuff in Chicago, like back in the day, like for God damn it, or, you know, like maybe I'll catch fire. I don't think there's tons of really high-quality live recordings out there. So, I mean, more of the newer live stuff that they've put out, I would say if you're looking for live Alkaline Trio stuff, they've put out way much better stuff like the past live things. But, yeah, that DVD, I mean, if you've never seen it, the, the, the uh, like, I mean, the stage show is awesome. I mean, they're all kind of dressed up for Halloween, and the stage looks really neat. Like, they all look really cool. But just, you know, I don't think it's them at their best, you know, and they are a good live band. It just doesn't represent them. You know what I mean? There's other bands, too, where – they're they're good depending when you see them. I mean, two bands who have some really really good live records, but also it's a hit or miss. Who I mean are very close together, but would be the Replacements and the Heartbreakers. And I mean, the Replacements, classic, classic, classic. If you if you were a fan of the Replacements, you already know this. It all depended on the night you saw them. You either got the greatest live show of your life. You saw the greatest live band you have ever seen, or you got four drunks on stage who did like 
like would slow down their song. You know what I mean? Like if they were playing for a punk crowd, they would slow down their punk songs and make them like lounge music. They would, you know, I mean, they would just start doing covers and not even finishing like covers. They didn't even know how to play. They're like, yeah, I think that song's in D and Bob would start playing like a riff, like half ass. Like it's kind of right. It's kind of not like you can kind of tell what song it is. And then, you know, they make it like 30 seconds in before just falling apart. I mean, there's, 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 Like, more than one occasion, there's people who tell you stories. They would cover a song multiple times in a set. They would just start. I've heard stories where, like, if a a set would be going bad or a cover would go bad, they'd just start playing Help Me Rhonda, like, just multiple times in a set. Like, just, you know, classic things like that. But they were a band who, when they were on fire, they were on fire. And, you know, a few years ago, they put out for sale their uh, Live at Maxwell's in 1986, which has been circulated for years and years as Murder at Maxwell's. Um, but this was the first proper release and definitely sounded the best. I mean, it sounded better than any recording that's out there. You know, obviously, it's an official release through Rhino Records. But that, to me, that is that is a quintessential live album. And, you know, I mean, even though the, the set is from 1986, it was only released back in 2017, the uh, the proper release and it's just it's absolutely amazing. I mean, the, the second you hear it, you go, "This is a band on fire." And that's another good example. In 1986, it's a bookend to them because it's in between Tim and Please to Meet Me, and it's right before Bob Stinson is kicked out of the Replacements. So this is this is a bookend to the Bob Stinson era of the Replacements. And you couldn't ask for a better set. They play stuff off all the albums. They also have the classic replacements covers. I mean, there are there are more than enough covers on there. There's more than enough. I mean, just whether it's the stage banter, Paul Westerberg yelling murder through the song through in the middle of songs, just constantly yelling murder. Thus, the original bootleg being called Murder at Maxwell's. Just just everything about it to me, as someone who I mean, 1986, I wasn't born. I wasn't even born yet. I was born like seven years later, so I, I'm terrible at math. You would think I'd know that. It's something like seven years later I was born. But, like, I listen to that and I go, "This, I get it. Like, when you hear people go, yeah, when they were on, they were on. Like, people who will tell you who they saw their replacements live and tell you they saw one of the best shows, this is what they heard. They heard live at Maxwell's. This was the one. Now, they also, the shit hits the fans, one of the greatest titled live albums out there. But, uh... It, you know the, the first the first live record from the replacements on cassette from twin tone back and that one was released in i believe 1983 that one was released in between i think let it be and tim that was that was their uh, last twin tone release if i'm not mistaken another one with bob stinson still on it but see that is the other side of the band that is that is the band not on their best night, you know, recorded in front of a few people. It, it doesn't, you know, and it, there's a charm to it. Like you listen to it and you kind of laugh. I mean, it's in the name. The shit hits the fans. Like it, it the, you couldn't title it a better title. Like that is the replacements on their off night, but on their on night is them on for sale. And I mean, it's just blazing through. I mean, just a career defining set. I mean, all the best from the Bob Stinson era. Really, really good. Another good replacements one from a, a few years later in Concerated, which they, uh, which up until just a few months ago actually was a five song promo EP that they put out. It was recorded live at the University of Wisconsin, but we just finally got that entire set that Sire recorded. It is a board recording, which means it sounds really, really good. But they just released that with Dead Man's Pop, that Don't Tell a Soul uh, box set that they put out back in, uh, back in I believe it was September of last year and uh, that was the first time ever ever releasing the whole thing they were on fire on that one too and that one that one's cool because it's the other side of it this is this is a bookend to Bob Stinson era replacements whereas the live at University of Wisconsin it's the it's the beginning basically of the uh, of the slim era you know, he'd been in the band about a year or so. Pleased to Meet Me was already out and obviously he didn't play on that record, but he did play the live shows. So this is Slim. He'd been in the band for a little while, but still the new guy. He had time to play with them. And I think it really shows on that record. I think you listen to it. And, I mean, there, there's actually even, I'll even say this. I would say, like, there's a few songs on there that are on both For Sale and on the uh, on the Inconcerated, the uh, deluxe edition on on the uh, new uh, Don't Tell a Soul box set 
at least new while you're listening to this. Maybe it's old if you're listening in a few years. But uh, anyways, there's a few songs that are on both of those that Bob Stinson originally played on that Slim probably does, I would say, even a better job than Bob does on For Sale. That, uh, I mean, just even more energy. I mean, and, and the band as a whole, too, not just Slim. But, you know, obviously they have different guitar players. That would be the uh, the different factor there. But, I mean, there's there's parts of it that, I mean, he is on fire. He's playing some of Bob's parts and kind of adding his own uh, kind of Slim's part. Because that's the interesting thing about them, too, is two guitar players. Slim and Bob Stinson are not the same guitar player. They did not replace Bob Stinson with a, uh, you know, basically with a replica of Bob Stinson. They got someone else with a totally different style. And, I mean, I think they did that on purpose as well, and I think it ended up working. I, I love what Slim did on uh, on Don't Tell a Soul as well as his contributions on uh, All Shook Down. But, you know, that that's another one. I think it's another era of the replacements a few years later that really show them off as just such a great live band. And also, I think it also shows, you know, it's from it being during Don't Tell a Soul era, them promoting Don't Tell a Soul, there's a lot of songs from that record on that live album. But what's really cool is a lot of people didn't like Don't Tell a Soul because it's overproduced and the reverb on it. It doesn't sound like this on here. Those songs blend in and just sound like replacement songs. Like the things that that fans don't like about, you know, I don't like Aiken to be because, you know, it sounds too polished and I don't like the reverb and, you know, I don't like talent show because of this or that. It's gone on these. You know what I mean? It puts the grit back on them. It just is a loud rock band playing those songs. Like, I think Talent Show is a great example of that. If you ever hear the demos to Talent Show, or even not just that, just hear the Matt Wallace mix that came with uh, Dead Man's Pop. I mean, it's a great example of that. Hearing those songs before they were really overly produced, you know, kind of, you know, putting, putting too many hands on it. And just when it was stripped back as a rock band playing these songs totally different. And I and I think that is awesome. I think that's that's one of the cool things about the Inconcerated set is that you hear those songs and you go, oh, wow, they just sound like replacement songs. And same with their version of Here Comes a Regular on there, kind of a, I wouldn't call it electric version so much as a full band version, but a whole different side of that song, which is just absolutely amazing. So, I mean, the replacements have, and the shit hits the fans. It has its charm, but it has its charms for its other reason. Like the thing with Inconserated and uh, and For Sale, those are good sets. Those are the bands that those are the replacements just sounding so good live. Whereas the shit hits the fans, you go, I like this because I'm a fan. I would never, if someone had never heard the replacements, like I was saying earlier with Against Me with 23 Live Sex Acts, you could play that for someone who'd never heard Against Me, and I feel like it would turn them on to Against Me because it's career, it, it spans their career, it all sounds really good. I feel like they get a good vibe of who Against Me is. Now, if you play them, the shit hits the fans, they're going to go, these guys sound like a bunch of alcoholics who were handed instruments and were like, you know, kind of like prodded onto a stage and kind of, you know, like heckled into like making asses of themselves, if you will, whereas... Whereas, you know, Inconserated and uh, For Sale, it's not like that. It's the band sounding really good, like really solid musicians who have played together and know what they're doing. You know, still that replacement's charm, you know, don't get me wrong. There's still there's still covers in there. There's still funny stage banter. But, you know, I, I just think it's a, a different thing. And I mean, also with kind of like with the motion of that, you know, thankfully, it's funny because the replacements come from a time before having all this like, like technology at hand where you could just record every live show yet we're really lucky because there is databases out there and archives full of the replacements live back in the 80s and I gotta say a lot of it sounds pretty good it doesn't sound like you know a lot of times you'll hear you know live recordings from back in the day that just don't sound good and you know not not to any fault but but to the technology of the time you know it was limited and not all of it sounds great you listen back and it's like oh it's cool because it's an artifact of the time But it doesn't really sound good. It's not something you want to sit around and listen to. Whereas replacement fans did a really good job of like recording them live back in the 80s with what they had. And, you know, we have really good bootlegs because of it. But we also have some really good official releases. And uh, one that has never gotten an official release but was broadcasted on the radio. So there's like like recordings of that. So it does sound good because it's still it was still being recorded you know, professionally and broadcasted, but their very last show in Grant Park in 1991, um, their very last show on July 4th, 1991 at the Taste of Chicago Festival, because it's once again that time and place thing. I think 
There's a lot of good songs on it, but that one is very all shook down and don't tell a soul heavy. Like that was the one bummer about that to me is I feel like they were playing the set that they were probably playing that whole tour, which I think they and they knew it was their last tour and they were and they were promoting all shook down. So I understand the set list. The set list makes set makes sense for the time that it was recorded. But for being their last show, I wish they would have kind of, you know, played more fan favorites and kind of went further back into the catalog. Like they did, they, their last song was Hoot Nanny, which is great. I mean, that's the famous, you know, it, it's not over till the fat roadie sings. And I mean, that was the famous one where they played Hoot Nanny for like, I think 20 something minutes and they all slowly just started getting off stage and roadies would come on and replace them. You know, so like like Paul would walk off stage and, and his roadie would come out and start playing his part. You know, Slim would walk off stage. Steve Foley walked off stage. I, th- I, I want to say Tommy was the last one off the stage. But, you know, I mean, set list aside, going more to part of what makes a live album so good and kind of that time and place thing is it's about the stage banter and some of the things that, that Paul is saying throughout the set. And Tommy is Tommy and Slim as well. They they say little little smir- little smirky things here and there. But it's one of the, it's interesting because the audience doesn't know that they're that what they're listening and watching to right now is the final replacement show. They don't know that, but the replacements do. Basically the four guys on stage are the only people who know what's going on, that this is their last show. So with that in mind, you listen to it and it's very interesting. From the songs that they play, from the stage banter, the little things they they they. Uh, well, here's a great example actually. If you not know it, the uh, intro of the show, the very first thing that you ever hear when listening to whether it's the podcast or the radio show, is that here's another one you don't want to hear. Frankly, neither do I. That's Paul Westerberg at the last replacement show. So that gives you an example of that. What you hear at the beginning of the show to me is one of the funniest things. That's what he says before breaking into. Oh, what I it was an all shook down song, I want to say. It might be uh oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Oh, what song is it? I can oh, it Oh, this is gonna kill me. I'm not gonna remember right now. I'll probably say in ten minutes in this episode, all of a sudden it's gonna hit me. But uh it's one of the songs on the last record. And it, yeah, before he breaks into it, here's another one you don't want to hear. Frankly, neither do I. And you can hear it in his voice. Like when you know that and you go, This is their last set. You can hear it. You can hear the exhaustion. You can hear a band at the end of their rope, basically, and a, a band who's just this is it. This is the, we've we've given it our all. It's over. And I mean that's another great live one. You know, it, not an official live release, but you can easily get your hands on that uh, very last set. I mean, even on vinyl and stuff, you can buy it on CD and vinyl. It's it's never been officially released by the band or anything, but you can get the whole set. It sounds amazing. But that's another one where what makes that one so good is knowing what you know. Like I think if it was just a replacement set on any given day, it's not a bad set, but knowing that it's their last one and what happened before it and after it and everything, including after reading Trouble Boys, where you get the whole behind the scenes and what happens after they all get off the stage and the roadies are playing Hoot Nanny, it's just so interesting, you know. And another band, like I mentioned earlier, the Heartbreakers, who it depends when you got them. I mean, their drug habits were not secret, including Johnny Thunders, but also the rest of them. You know, none of them were clean, none of them were saints. And there were times you go see them and not just drunks. We're talking about guys on stage who are high off their asses on on heroin, on coke. I mean, just doing like speed balls and stuff and getting on stage. And there were times where it was really, really good. And there were other times where it was a bunch of junkies on stage, kind of like with the replacements where it was four drunks on stage just playing their instruments. It was four junkies on stage playing their instruments, including the live video. There's live video of them out there where, you know, you, you, you can see Johnny thunders like, yeah, that guy's like, that's, that's what it looks like when someone is so messed up beyond belief and playing on stage, like just prime example. But that's, that's not diminishing him. Johnny thunders. I mean, a goddamn legend for sure. He also, the other side of that was, this is a man who he had his habits. I mean, he had some bad habits. This guy could be so strung out, you know, I mean, obviously not advocating it or saying it like it's a great, you know, I'm not like glorifying it, but I mean, the guy could also, the other end of it would be so destroyed out of his mind as well. Like I said, the rest of the heartbreakers on, I mean, just cocaine, heroin, alcohol, just any, the the pills of the day, you know, whatever they could get their hands on in the seventies, like all of that stuff. And this man would rip a guitar solo 
like no other. This man would just, he would not miss a beat. He would he would play his guitar parts like 100% correct. He would hit all the notes. He would sing amazing. It just depended who you got. I mean, that that man could give you the greatest show of your life or the worst show of your life, I mean, as with the rest of them. But I would say one of the defining live records of that band, and a lot of people say it's even, you know, because obviously their only studio album is, is uh, LAMF, but they're live at Max's Kansas City. A lot of people like that over even LAMF, where it's just, it is a solid, solid band just going at it. Just four guys on stage, like the replacements. I mean, which obviously they they influence the replacements greatly. I mean, Johnny Thunders played a bunch of stuff with the Mats, and the replacements covered the Heartbreakers constantly um, live. But it's like that live at Max's Kansas City, you know, who knows what they're on? I'm, sh- I'm sure they were on something. But hey, all of them were playing so well. They were locking in together. And it's like, that's another one. The band wasn't perfect. But they were just so good, it didn't matter. And I think that's another one where it's a great example of them being so influential to punk bands. You know, you ask most of those guys in the Heartbreakers, they didn't think they were a punk band. I don't know if any of them did. I don't think any of them really liked being called a punk band. They didn't like it. They didn't like being called that. Which, you know, I mean, I I, I don't think they were against the association like with other, like I don't think they hated punk. They didn't like being called a punk band. I mean, you know, they they... They toured with the Sex Pistols. Well, they didn't even tour. That's the infamous tour that they did with the Sex Pistols in The Damned that they, I think, like three shows were played. Not to them. It was the Sex Pistols' fault. But there were like three shows on that tour that I actually think were ever played. But, you know, they played with punk bands. They obviously influenced a slew of punk bands. And I I think they were cool with that. I I don't think it was like, you know, Johnny Thunders wrote off punk rock as like, well, I hate that. Like, how dare they be influenced by me? You know, but I, I think I don't think he liked being called it. And I do think like he felt like it was cheap. I don't feel like he thought punk was I think punk he kind of thought was maybe a little more silly, less proficient. Cause I mean Johnny Thunders was a proficient player. That guy could play guitar. I mean, I obviously I'm not state I'm stating the obvious here. I'm not I'm not saying anything groundbreaking, but that man was insanely good at guitar and I, I don't think he loved being called you know, because really when you think of punk guitar players, I mean Steve Jones amazing guy who could play could still play a great lead I think you know even though he was a punk guitar player but a lot of times it does it conjures up the thought of basically just kind of power chords kind of a three chord thing and Johnny didn't do that Johnny played guitar solos he wasn't against you know playing a 30 second guitar solo and stuff you know and 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 as he should he was great at it you know I mean I I think without being self-indulgent too he could play without it being too much going, okay, that guy is overplaying. It's like, no, that's it's Johnny Thunders and you want to hear him play, you know, he can keep playing that solo. You don't get tired of it because he knows what he's doing and he keeps it interesting. But I think that Live at Max's Kansas City really does. I think it shows them as a raw rock band. And whether they like it or not, you can hear why punk bands are influenced by them. You know, you can you can hear it in the rawness of those songs. You can go, okay, this might not be a punk band, but you can hear why they influenced so many punk bands, you know, later on. And I think a lot of punk bands of that era, you know, I mean, what see, and I kind of consider the Heartbreakers, it's like, yeah, they're a rock band to a degree, but I, I, whether or not the members of the band see themselves that way, me personally, just me personally, I, I do kind of put them in with that. I mean, I, I kind of throw them in with the, with the Ramones and the Sex Pistols in that kind of class of 77, obviously they were before it. I mean, they influenced a lot of that, but it's like, they also had Richard Hell in the band. You know what I mean? And Chinese Rocks, which was written originally by D.D. Ramone and Richard Hell. It's like, there's too much punk associated with the band that, that you know, I, I, think it's, I think it's crazy not to, you know, use the P word with them, you know, it, and not, not that that's all they were. They were more than a punk band. But I, w- I would definitely say that you need to use that word when it's talking to them because they're the godfathers of it a lot of ways as well. I mean, you know, including with the Richard Hell Association because he is a godfather of punk, including the aesthetics of it. But, uh, you know, just an important band that, that you know, I don't think gets the credit. I mean, obviously, Heartbreakers have, you know, the cult following, but I also think they're bigger in a lot of other countries instead of the United States. But I think it was that even the beginning. I think... I think they always, even when they were active, like they were bigger in the the UK and stuff than they ever were in the United States. They never, even they were reunited and stuff. 
I think they played a lot of shows in like New York City and stuff, but if they were reuniting through the 80s and 90s like they did from time to time, they'd go play other countries. They wouldn't play a lot in the United States. I think mostly like New York City, but outside of that, not a lot out, outside of there. But, you know, this is a band, this is this is a band before the reunions all that. Just a great live band with LAMF out, you know, just a great great band with a great record out. They sound amazing on it, you know. It's just another one that, uh, you know, the kind of time and place thing as well, where it's like a lot of punk bands of that time, you know, whether it's the Heartbreakers, whether it's like the Ramones, it's alive. That's another great live record, which also recently got reissued and uh, remastered. Sounds amazing. But it's like it, it's of that time. And what I love about it is you go, hey, I w-, and maybe, you you know, if you were, I'm, I'm very jealous of you of this. But, hey, I was not around in 1977. I did not I did not see the Ramones at CBGB's. I, I never got to see the Sex Pistols live. Like I was never there for that. So to have really good live recordings that that make you go, it's a time and place. You you hear that Ramones record, it's alive, and it's like once again, it's not a document of you know Johnny Ramones not ripping the most insane guitar solos you've never heard or that you've ever heard. You know Tommy Ramones not doing these insane fills. Joey Ramone isn't isn't being Freddie Mercury. It's just a good punk rock band. They're playing these songs fast and raw. And you realize why we all love punk. It brings you back to why you love this genre in the first place or why you love the Ramones. You go, that's all it is. This isn't a band like trying to be perfect. It's just a good punk band. And you go, oh, yeah, like that's why we like them. That It reminds you there's the energy. That's why we love that band. You know, it, it's just it's amazing. And, you know, like like the Sex Pistols really never had an official one. Um, I'm, I, there, there's different live things sitting out there. I've never dwelled far enough, I guess. And I love the Sex Pistols, but I've never dwelled too far into a lot of the live stuff. But they're another one where it's like you want to hear what is out there, like the live, the live stuff, because you go, it was such a time and place. You know, they've reunited a few times over the years, but they were only around for a couple years in the beginning. And it's like hearing that stuff from the little time that they're around is amazing, you know, because once again, it really captures that. And that's another thing that makes a live album, I, I think, so good is, is that that capturing two things with a live album, I think, is capturing the time and place. And really, it also goes with kind of that lack of production because with it being being raw and being very true to that time without screwing with it too much, you know, without it. And it, it's kind of this weird balance, too, because you want it to sound timeless in a way where you could listen to it. And any like that, that that you can go back and listen to the Heartbreakers live at Max's Kansas City. That record's forty something years old now. And that record's like double my age. But I can go back and go like, oh shit, I get it. I get it. I like. I love this. I get the appeal. I I start to question why it wasn't bigger when it was you know first released. Like why the Heartbreakers weren't bigger. Like it's one of those things where a good live recording will make you realize that if you weren't there, I think it does two things. If you were there, it transports you back. And if you weren't there, it transports you to a place that you weren't. And I mean, kind of going outside the live realm, there's a lot of bands and artists who I think that's also their strong suit. Um, I talked to CJ Ramone about this a few years ago and I interviewed him. He did a solid cover of Tom Waits' Pony on his uh, album American Beauty. And we were talking about Tom Waits for like a solid 10 minutes. I was just kind of talking about, about his favorite Tom Waits records and all that. And what I mentioned is what makes Tom Waits so good is it makes you it can make you nostalgic for a time you were never in. Like I've I was not around in the 50s yet. I can hear, you know, Burma Shave and it transports me back to like driving down Route 66 in the 50s. Like down like a a two-lane road in like just just seeing fields and grass and not much else just driving through the Midwest section of Route 66 through like Missouri and Kansas and Illinois. And it conjures up all these thoughts. You understand it. Like he's another one live, like his song Burma shave specifically, there's a great one. And this, this is also a bootleg. Romeo is bleeding. It's Tom Waits live in uh, Austin, Texas back in the seventies, which is my favorite era. I love, I, I like the experimental stuff he did later on in the eighties and nineties and all the stuff he's done with his uh, wife, Kathleen. Like there's some really neat stuff and I think in a lot of ways, it's almost more of what people think of when they think of Tom Waits is some of that later stuff. And uh, I mean, even even pre Kathleen, but like Rain Dogs and Swordfish Trombones. And I like that stuff. But to me, the first couple records, 
the very the very like Kerouac and Bukowski set to music kind of albums, like where it sounds like a beat poet who basically also happens to be a really good musician, like ba- basically that stuff. And and there's a live version on Romeo is Bleeding of Burma Shave where he's describing before he gets before he breaks into song, he's talking about like like the back the these towns that you drive through not the ones on the interstate but anyone who's ever even present day if you've ever driven the back roads on like some random route like route 66 i mean that's a great example of that where you're just going through small town america and you go through these little towns every 20 miles you pass through he talks about there's a gas station and a tasty freeze and that's about it and a post office like there ain't much else but he does it in such a way it conjures up these thoughts right before. And it's genius because as, as the music starts, before he starts singing the song, it's this buildup. And what he conjures up in your head, he paints this vivid picture for you and then goes into the song. And I, I just think, like, that's one where the live version, I will take the live version of Burma Shave over the studio version. I mean, that says something about, you know, an artist live when you do that. Because, like I said, normally, I mean, I'm normally a studio version guy. I mean, there's some really good live versions out there. But I think most people are like that. Like if you're in the mood, if I don't know off the top of my head, I mean, if I want to hear the replacements, Bastards of Young, there's good live versions out there. But I'm going to probably listen to the Tim version, you know, just the the studio version. You know, I I feel like most people do that. And uh, that Burma Shave one off Romeo is Bleeding, I mean, that's one where I would take that over the studio version. on. I think that one's on Blue Valentine. Um, I would I would take it over that one, and I could be wrong. It may not be on blue as I as I say that it may not be on Blue Valentine, whichever one. Tom Waits has like fifty records. <laughs> I don't know. It's on one of those ones, uh, but and he's another one live too. Where if if you're, uh, you know, I mean, I don't really play Tom Waitsy stuff on the show, so I know he may not be everyone's cup of tea. I think he's very polarizing. I, mean, I did not like Tom Waits for years. It took me to age. What really got me into Tom Waits was the Atari's covered Christmas card from a hooker in Minneapolis. And what I liked about it is they didn't change it much. It was just Chris Rowe behind a piano, just like the original song from Tom Waits. But once I realized it was Charles Bukowski set to music, I'm like, oh, I totally get this. But with that said, like what I, what I like about Tom Waits, you know, I mean, to kind of get into him, including if you like live stuff is if you're not into Tom Waits, I would almost say go listen to his live albums first, including that stuff from the 70s. Um, because there's so many songs that he just, that they're never the same live. You can listen to him and go, he changes something every time. Like that version on, uh, on Romeo is bleeding a Burma shave. You're never going to hear another live version like that. There's other live versions. None of them are as good as that. He tell whether it's the improvisation. I mean, whether it's how so there's songs where, you know, you hear the live version before he recorded in the studio and you hear like truly raw and organic how that song originally sounded like he's a great example of that of of you know just live people you know just really really good and a good example of why you want to hear stuff live you know i mean bands need to give you give you a reason a lot of times to go check them out live you know what what makes you want to listen to a live album and not a studio recording you know what are they doing in that 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 i go i would rather this instead of something that's kind of polished and cleaned up you know, and I, I think he's a good example of that. I think also just kind of what he always did, always kept it, even to this day. I mean, he's still an interesting, you know, musician and artist. And it's just like, I, I think knowing, knowing to change it up and keep it original like that, you know, not just, hey, you're getting what you heard on the, on the record. It's just live now. He never, he's never done that. You're, you know, it's the same with another guy who I don't really, you know, I don't play on the show, but I am, a, I am definitely a fan of, but Bob Dylan's another guy like that where like, you're never really going to get what you heard on record live. You know, he's just not going to do that. Lou Reed also did that. You're not, you go, you can go see Lou, or you could go see Lou Reed live. And it's like, you know, if you were going to go see him, like you would probably hear Pale Blue Eyes, but it's not going to sound like when the Velvet Underground recorded it. You know, it's it's going to it's gonna sound like how he was doing it at the time. And it's interesting because some people like that, some people don't. And I get it. I'm I'm I can be both ways because there's times where I think artists do that, like Tom Waits, and I think it's awesome because it's like it gives you something different every time, but it's consistently good. There are other artists who I think sometimes do that, and even though they may they may even claim that it's well, you know, 
I do that because I always want to change it up or a song is always, you know, progress. like I've heard that and I, and I get that where it's like a song is always changing just because we recorded it, you know, it can continue to progress and grow, you know, and I think that's an interesting thing. And I think some bands do that, but I do think there's other artists where it's like either they just don't, you know, they, they can't sing it like they once did. They're just not into the song and kind of, I, I also think there's that where it's like a lot of times the band's biggest songs I think Bob Dylan has that in a way. I, th- I think there is a part of him where it's like, as an artist, he just wants to change them, keep them interesting. And I also think there's another side of him where when you've played like a Rolling Stone 10,000 times, it gets to a point where you go, I'm going to kill my <laughs> – maybe, w- maybe I won't go that far, but it's like I'm going to bash my head in if I have to play this goddamn song one more time. And the way you get through that is – well, let's make it new. You know, I've played this song so many times I could play in my sleep. I'm bored. I don't want to play it anymore. So what keeps it interesting, you know, for the artist and for the fans, because, you know, I think it makes the artist kind of reinvigorated, but they go, okay, I'm going to change it up. You know, I'm going to add this or do that and kind of make it. The Ataris also do that, you know, kind of a very similar to Bob Dylan, the Ataris. I'm kind of jumping all around, but, you know, the Ataris, the Ataris are a good one like that, where if you go see them live, I think they do it really, really well, actually. They're a band. They're a good example of this, where I think they have a good mix of you know what song it is. Because there's some bands who, I mean, change songs so much where you go, you can't tell what song it is until, like, the third verse. Where you go, oh, I wouldn't even know that that was the song because it's so slowed down in a different key. And it's like, you know, they're changing the phrasing of the words, but it's like all of a sudden you go, oh, like, or they get to the chorus and you hear the hook and you go, oh, it's that song. The Ataris don't do that, but what they do is the Ataris will play their old stuff, but like Chris Rowe is into, you know, as you can hear on like Welcome the Night, like you hear his his love for like shoegaze and some of like the more rock elements and not just being a straight up pop punk band. And they'll play a lot of songs from like Blue Skies and some of the older stuff and they still sound like those songs. They're still punk rock songs. They sound amazing. But they will add, like, a bridge where they kind of jam on it or, you know, they'll throw maybe, like, a couple different effects on the guitar that isn't in the studio version. Like, different things like that that make it sound modern. But what I think it does, I think it keeps it interesting for Chris Rowe and the other guys in the Ataris. I think it keeps those songs interesting that they've been playing now for, you know, 20-plus years. But also the fans still like it. Like, you can hear it. Like, I'm even saying personally as a fan, like, I hear it and I like that. Like, it doesn't bother me because I go – it's still San Dimas high school football rules, but it's like, okay, they added this neat bridge, but I go, I like that. You know what I mean? Like, okay, it's not the song in pure form. They're not being purists. They're not playing it note for note like it is on the record, but it's like, <clears throat> they're also not, you know, like butchering it or changing it up so much that you can't tell that it's, that it's that song, you know, until halfway through where you go, oh my God, like they're playing, like I didn't even, re- you know, I didn't even recognize that song, like nothing like that. You know, because I, I do think bands can do that as well, which I don't think is great. But the Ataris are a good example of a band like that who kind of throughout the years go, you know, these these songs kind of progress, you know, not that they become a whole different thing, but it's like we can kind of add this in here and it keeps it interesting. And, you know, if you come see us 10 times, it's like it's not like you start getting bored either. You don't start going, oh, man, you know, it's the same song for the 10th time. It's like there's something new and original about it, which I really appreciate you know, artists doing. And I think you hear it less in punk rock. I I really, I think punk and alternative and a lot of bands that I play on here, you know, thus I kind of started, you know, like mentioning like Lou Reed and Tom Waits and Bob Dylan, you know, kind of other guys who kind of out of that realm, though I think they've also influenced so many bands, you know, that, that I talk about and love on this show that, you know, I think they're worth talking, obviously, I mean, they're legends too. So they're obviously worth talking about, but I think those are a good example of, of guys who kind of change things up throughout the years. And also, once again, I mean, career spanning where it's like when you've been around for 30, 40 years, you have a lot of records to choose from. I, I saw Bob Dylan last year, actually, in uh, last September, I saw, or no, last October, I saw him a few months ago in uh, Mankato, Minnesota, and he was great. And it's like, he's an example of that. Like, you look up set lists. It's funny because before the show, I started looking up like what he's been playing lately. But it's like, that's a guy where it's like, is anyone ever going to truly be happy with everything he's playing? Because it's not like he's depriving, like, I don't think he's purposely depriving anyone of any songs. But it's like, when you've had a career, literally since the 60s, like, I mean, you've, you have a 50 plus year, like, back catalog to go through. You can only, like, you can only play a couple songs per album, you know? Like, you almost can't get mad at him for not playing a certain song because you go, if he plays 20 songs, 
he can't even play like one song off each of his record. Like I don't even know that's I don't even think he could do that. He probably has more studio records than that. So it's like even if he wanted to do that, you want to go I'm going to please everyone by playing one song off each off each, off each of my records. You know, so like at least you get something off your favorite record. No matter what your favorite Bob Dylan record is, you'll still hear something off it. Even with that, you ain't going to hear your favorite song. You might hear something off your favorite record, not your favorite song probably. And it, and it's not him depriving you know, it's not one of those things where a band has three albums and it's like they don't want to play that fan favorite. Like face to face, I've only seen them since they've since they've re- reunited, and they'll play disconnected now. I mean, people want to hear that, but I do think there was a time they would not play that live, and it wasn't a thing of we have too many songs. It was more of I think they got tired of playing it. They didn't like only kind of being known for that song, and you know, I, I kind of get it. But then there's the other side, and I think other bands get it. Too, where you hear a lot of bands will say things like, because you'll ask them, hey, do you still play this song? Do you ever get sick of playing this song? And normally their answer is, hey, if I went and saw, like, say, Kiss play, I'd be angry if they didn't play, like, you know, this song, this song, or this song. And I I think that is very true. You know, so you kind of get it where it's like, okay, the artist might be annoyed of playing that song a hundred times, but it's like, as the fan and the person who's coming to the show, you want to hear that song, you know? So it's like, that's probably why, you know, like say face to face, probably put like disconnected back in their set. You know, that, that was less of one where it's like kind of more now they have more albums. So it's like, okay, if you don't hear a really old song, it might not be them saying, yeah, screw that song. It's more of like, Hey, we just have too many records now, you know? So I, I, I think I think when you get to a certain place, you know, it's it's harder to really do that career spanning set and please everybody. You know, it obviously becomes more difficult, but uh, there's certain people who do it well. You know, I mean, obviously against me on 23 Live Sex Acts, like I was saying, I mean, you know, they, they, they have quite the back catalog. Do they have the back catalog catalog of like Bob Dylan? No, obviously it's not as hard to, you know, play three or four songs off a record where it might be for like Bob Dylan. But, uh, you know, I, I think that's so important, what, kind of just getting back to it, you know, like what makes a live record so good is that kind of career spanning, you know, really spanning your career, hitting all the good notes, too. And, and a lot of times, too, doing it where it's like, you know, adding a song or two off the albums that weren't the best ones, you know, maybe not the fan favorites, but, but really pleasing people who like those albums as well and maybe also turning people on. Because I think a good live record, too, will have songs off an album that you may not be crazy about, maybe even a song that you're not crazy about, but maybe it's done in a different light and it turns you on to it. Like there's there's a lot of songs I've had off that where like there's a band where it's like, hey, I'm not that crazy on that song or I don't like it at all. And then I'll hear it on a live record in a different light and you go, oh my God, like, no, I like this song. I just don't like it on the record. Whether it's like, I don't like the production on the record I don't like, you know, it maybe it's maybe it's like more of a ballad on the record or it's the other way and it's like too too like abrasive and it's like they changed it into a ballad live like whatever it is, you know, a lot of times there's that too where a live record can really make you rethink a studio album. You know, I I think there's a lot of that where a good live record They'll play songs off a certain album that you might neglect and you go, oh, my God, what am I doing? Like time to go back and listen to that more, you know, and I I think that's another thing that just makes for really, really solid, you know, solid live record. And, uh, you know, really, really a good live series you go check out, too. You know, as far as punk music is concerned, Fat Records has just brought it back as well, but they were doing live and a dive for a long time where, uh, you know, just live records of Fat Records bands. And uh, they they just recently started doing it again, Face to Face put out, I believe, their second one. They have a few live records out, speaking of Face to Face, that are uh, really good. But, like, this last one, this live in a dive that they did is probably probably their best one because they did. I, I, they just play stuff throughout their whole career, and it's really good. Whereas you hear some of the old ones, like, I think they're uh, – it might be like Econo Live. They, like I said, they have a few different live records, but I think it's Econo Live that's on. Like they don't, like I was mentioning, where they stopped playing Disconnected. That was that era. Like they didn't play Disconnected. They kind of, it sounds more like that time and place where it's like they were promoting, I think at the, at the time, maybe their self-titled record. So it's like there's a lot of songs off that album and, you know, like less, less spread out through their catalog. Whereas like this new Live in a Dive, it's like it's more career spanning set. And I think it makes for a better live record. A lot of times, a lot of times I think a band recording their live record a little further on in their career is the better thing too. Because like I said, I mean, that's how you have, it's harder to have, you know, a career defined, a career spanning set if you have three records, you know what I mean? It's like, if you're playing 12 songs, 
you know, you're probably playing a majority of each record. You know, I mean, I'm just like there's bands that I've seen who have like a full length and an EP out and they just play everything they've ever released, basically, you know. But it's like the bands who have a back catalog to go through, I think a lot of times it, it can be difficult. You know, it may not seem like it because it's like, oh, we'll just throw our greatest hits on or something. But to make a really good career defining and spanning set that has your strong suits, you know, those greatest hits, but also the fan favorites, maybe some B-sides, maybe a lot of songs that people don't hear. You know, I mean, the men's singers don't have any live records out. But what I really like about them, I've seen them live a bunch of times. And they, I think, every time have played at least one song that was either a B-side to a 7-inch, was an obscure, like, cover that they do, was a song that they had on, like, a split 7-inch, like, an unreleased, you know, like, like songs that were, like, on, like on comps that were, like, unreleased except for on compilations. Like, they always will throw in a song or two that, like, the average person who, like, if you only know their studio albums, have never really dwelled into them, you won't know those songs. And it's like, it's kind of throwing a bone to the rest of us who, like, like, I love the men's singers. Like, I love everything they put out. So it's like, like, Irish Goodbyes, one of my favorite men's singer songs. That is a song that is on, like, an obscure run for cover records uh, compilation from, like, 2012. And they, I've heard them play that live multiple times like never thought I would never expect that band to play it that's not a song that I go in going I hope this like yeah I hope they play it but it's like I want to expect them to like I'm not I wouldn't be pissed if they didn't play it it's it's an obscure song half the audience more than half the audience I don't think knows it like you can tell from their reactions like half the audience doesn't know this song and they're playing it and it's like sure for for some of the people they may not be into it or I shouldn't even say not into it, but they might be like, oh, I don't know this song. But for us who know it, those in the audience who know it, you're, you're losing your mind. And, you know, that's a, that's a great band who, like, kind of will give you that nod in their sets. Like, hey, we'll play new stuff. But it's like, we'll also play that, like, weird, obscure song that we know, like, 30% of the crowd is going to be really stoked on, which I always like bands doing that, too. But, uh, you know, that that's more live, not live record. You know, I, I don't think they have any... Uh, Besides bootlegs, I mean, obviously with more, you know, new bands, I say a live record, you can go on YouTube and like see live footage and stuff of, you know, basically every band out there now, but, you know, properly well-recorded live record, you know, they don't have, which I think they should do sometime soon now they have a few albums, uh, you know, underneath their belt. But, you know, as we're closing up here, that's kind of a good, that's kind of an interesting uh, topic, you know, email me powercordhour at gmail.com. And what bands would you like to hear a live album from, you know? I've, I've talked about tonight a bunch of my favorite live records, ones that I think are really good, ones that make a good live record. What bands do you think would make a good live record? You know, what, even if they have albums out, I mean, maybe there's bands now where you go, you know, this band has a live album out, but I think right now, current day, you know, they, they sound like the best they ever have. So it's like I'd like to hear them do a live album now with this lineup. Or a band who has no, you know, live albums out. It's like I think this band – should put one out. Like, I think they have enough albums to do a cool career spanning set. Like, let me know who you would love to hear put out a live record. Powercordhour at gmail.com. And uh, you can email me there. And thank you so much for checking out the uh, this episode of the podcast. It has been a blast doing. Like I said, I can't believe we're five episodes in. It feels like just yesterday I was doing my little intro. But, uh, you know, email me. Let me know. Also, you can hit me up on there, powercordhour at gmail.com. I have brand new pins made for the show. And uh, I've gotten made some made in the past. But uh, these are some of my favorites. And got to say shout out to Think Twice Buttons who made them. I mean, if you ever need buttons made, uh, my dude, um, uh, Mike Jenkins, who uh, runs it, I mean, just an amazing, amazing guy. And uh, I, just really, really good dude. Makes amazing buttons and makes them really, really cheap. I mean, he he's an amazing guy. He, he knows what he's doing. High quality. Ships them out fast. I, mean, I ordered them, and they were here in like a week or two. Just really solid dude. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not even a sponsor of the show, but uh, he's also he's also Hawthorne Heights' uh, merch guy. So I've known him for years. I mean, I, I've known him long before I ever got any pins made, and he's just a really, really solid guy and makes really good pins. But uh, he made some cool ones. They, uh, I have a few different designs. One says, I got rad on the radio with the Power Chord Hour. Uh, we have another one that has the Power Chord Hour logo and says, at Power Chord Radio underneath has our uh, handle for all our social media. And if you're a Blink-182 fan, what I did get made for a couple years now, I, uh, I've had this Cheshire Cat ripoff. It's, it's the Cheshire Cat, Blink-182's Cheshire Cat album uh, artwork, but where it should say Blink-182, it says the Power Chord Hour. And uh, I've been using that for a couple years now, almost since the beginning of the show, actually, to promote the show. And uh, we now have that in pin form. So grab one of those. I, I do think it's funny, too, because 
you know, it, it's a smaller pin. So from a distance, someone would see it and just think it's, you know, like, oh, rad, you know, Cheshire Cat. But but on closer inspection, you will see it is the power cord hour. You can let them all know, go, you know, it, it ain't Blink-182. It is the power cord hour, fool. So you can let people know that. But, yeah, I have those and a couple power cord hour T-shirts as well. I have a few of those left, all size large. But I would love to send you this stuff. I got free swag. Uh, absolutely free. Hit me up, powercordhour at gmail.com as a thank you for supporting the show, including so early on. You know, I want to thank anyone. You know, we're 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 far from uh, from an established podcast. You know, we're still kind of getting our legs here. You know, we've been doing the radio show this month marks the fourth anniversary. I mean, we've been doing the radio show since February 2016. But you know, the podcast is a whole new monster and a, a fun monster at that. But, you know, I'm still navigating it, so I really do appreciate anyone supporting us this early on. So, you know, just as a thank you, hit me up. I got free pins, free T-shirts. I will uh, send them your way, powercordhour at gmail.com. And also make sure you're following us. We are at Power Cord Radio on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. We're on uh, Spotify, where I put up the playlist every week from the radio show. You know, if you've never checked out the radio show, which you should, it airs every Friday night at 10 Eastern on 107.9 WRFA in uh, Jamestown, New York. But you can listen to it anywhere. You can stream the station on uh, WRFALP.com. And on the WRFA mobile app, if you are on your iPhone, you can go look in the App Store. We do not have it for Android yet, but if you are an iPhone user, there's the WRFA app, and you can listen to the station right on there. So you can listen to the WRFA. You can listen to WRFA from anywhere, and you can also listen to the show from anywhere on that app or on the website uh, every Friday night at 10 Eastern. But uh, anyways, all the music I play on there, all the punk and alternative that your little hearts can desire, I put that up every week in our Spotify playlist as well as a bunch of other special playlists. So go check that out. Well worth your time. Uh, hopefully I turn you on to some new music on there. But uh, yeah. Follow us on all the social media. Let us know that you're listening. Let me know how you like the show. I appreciate the feedback. And uh, if you're not subscribed, subscribe and uh, leave us a review wherever you're listening at. And uh, we're also on YouTube if you're not. It's weird to say that because obviously uh, I'm sure a lot of you are listening on YouTube. That's a pretty popular way of listening to podcasts. But if you're not listening on YouTube, go check out our YouTube page because not only is the podcast episodes available on there, all our back catalog of all my interviews from the show you can find on there. I mean, and, and we're going back well worth your time. I mean, I've talked to Paul Cook from the Sex Pistols. I've talked to C.J. Ramone from the Ramones, uh, Stephen Jenkins from Third Eye Blind. I mean, the list goes on and on. And these are interviews that were never aired on this, on the podcast. They were aired on the radio show. I mean, some of these are going back to like 2017, 2016. So, you know, you have you have not heard them on here yet. So if you are new to the podcast and never heard the radio show, a lot of content that you've not heard yet. So go check that out on the Power Chord Hour YouTube page. But that is going to be the podcast for this week. Thank you so much for listening. And uh, for the Power Chord Hour podcast and the Power Chord Hour radio show, I'm Anthony Merchant. And thank you very much for listening.